Thank you, Michael. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, um, whenever I come to something like this, my, I always leave with my head spinning because I learn so many new things. Uh, and, and as Michael said to you, uh, I leave for this trip to, to the Middle East and Syria and, and Damascus and a series of other interviews in the Middle East where we're steeped in history but trying to find a way there to, to the future. Um, and I come here to something like this morning and I, I listen and I hear this explosion of things that all of you are involved in and interested in and, and it leaves me uh, with my head spinning and, and trying to comprehend. Uh, I come this morning into any conversation like this really as a, as a, as a layman. I, I have always wanted to make my program available to these kinds of ideas and, and Zynga, uh, Mark Pincus was on the program and John Doerr has been on the program obviously and and so many other people, everybody, but Steve Jobs, Steve did a program a long time ago before, even before it became Steve Jobs. Uh, but I am pleased, especially this morning, to take a look at two people that, that are, are doing fascinating things. John Doerr and I uh, got to know each other one in the 90s, and he asked me to do, uh, to come to the YPO, and I did that. Um, and then we became friends, and have remained friends, and John's interest in and a whole range of things beyond uh, investments um, from the venture capital standpoint, but including that a sense of, of our future and in terms of energy demands and, and where we're going in this world bring, makes him uh, this morning a, a per perfectly fascinating guest. So uh, with that, I, I'd like to begin with a very, very general question, which is uh, where are we in this revolution and this penetration of the internet and what comes next? Great question, Charlie, and uh, thanks for doing this. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I think, I think we're right on the verge of a third great wave of innovation. Uh, the first wave, the way I like to think about it, was the uh, microchip and the personal computer. It was the Andy Grove and, and, and the, the Steve Jobs in the early 80s that uh, brought those revolutionary technologies to, to the world and changed all of our lives. Uh, the second wave was around 1995, uh, the internet when uh, 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 then, I think he was a 23-year-old kid, Mark Andreessen, the big hulking guy from the University of Illinois. Still, Still a hulking guy from the University of Illinois. It was introduced to me by Jim Clark, and, and they brought the world's first commercial browser, uh, 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 Netscape's navigator to the world. They got in a fight with Microsoft, and then that was followed by at least what I was acutely aware of, Amazon. And then in 1999, uh, we saw these two uh, Larry and Sergey, these two Stanford dropouts, uh, introduced the 15th search engine called Google. And, and so that was wave two, the internet. The, the third wave, which is what we're entering right now, I'm searching for a name for it, but it's, it's a combination, I think, of social and mobile and some new kinds of commerce. And, 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 and the big idea, I think, is, is that we could be on the verge of reinventing the web, so that the web is instead of uh, documents and websites, it's, it's, it's people, it's places, it's relationships. And, and, and that's, that's a very exciting thing. Um, what will influence its velocity and its uh, dimension? Uh, I, I think one of, the, one of the really important drivers is applications. And, and Steve Jobs brought this to us with uh, with the iPhone and then, and then later on the iPad, and that is, we've created a whole new app economy. And so all kinds of, and that's transforming everything. All kinds of new services and, and applications are enabled by the relationships that are implicit and explicit between you and me and my interests and where I am. So uh, it's, it's turning this world uh, upside down in a really exciting way. Here, you're in the venture capital business and other businesses, but here's what's interesting to me. Take applications, and you've set up this uh, huge fund for went and raised some money because you understood where applications would go. This is pre-iPhone, or at the time of iPhone. And a friend of mine from Apple said to me, they showed it to you, and in the first hour, you said, I'm in. I did. Well, how did you know? <laughs> Well, I, I get to hang around a lot of really smart entrepreneurs and smart people. And then always in the uh, back of my mind is there's Bill Joy. And 
Bill Joy was whispering in, in my head. He said, John, uh, these smartphones, they change everything. They know who you are. They know where you are. They're broadband. They're always connected. They're always on. And that's a bigger deal than the PC. That's an extraordinarily powerful new platform. And sure enough, it's less than two years since Apple introduced that. They've sold 85 million uh, iPhones and iPod Touches. And then, uh, you know this very well, it, it was just this year that uh, Apple introduced the tablet, and there will be others, but uh, they sold a million tablets in 28 days. Now, it took them 74 days to sell a million of these. So this, this tablet, this, this iPad, is not some kind of big iPod. This, this is a new paradigm, and, and, and we're just at the beginning. Imagine 10 years forward. Well, you imagine 10 years forward. <laughs> <laughs> this audience, they imagine yeah, 10 exactly. years forward. <laughs> We could do a social network, and so we, we show clearly uh, why social networking is important by asking where we go in 10 years. But go ahead, think 10 years in terms of, because you said to me, uh, and, and I did a couple of shows on the iPad when he came out with, with Mossberg and others, uh, Steve Jobs held this up to you and said, this is my best life's work. He said that. He said, John, this is the best work of my life. And I said, well, to date. <laughs> <laughs> but why does he think that? It's not a computer. It's, uh, you don't need files. You don't need mice. They're so old, you know? Right. It, uh, it's magic, you know? What you see is what you Mice touch. are related to mouses. Though. Mice, mouses, right. And, and so I think Steve uh, reimagined a whole new experience that I don't want to call a computer. Uh, Im immersive new kinds of magical surfaces for uh, interactions but with happen? information and each other. You and I can have a conversation here, and it's not rude for me to to uh, point to this and show you stuff. Whereas if this was a laptop and I had this thing up here, that's not not socially acceptable. Yeah. These, but these, these my only small problem with that is that if people come on the show and sometimes I watch them as they're answering the question to me looking down like this. <laughs> that's, a, that's a rule that I would I, like. I found I can take it to concerts and symphonies and church. And <laughs> <laughs> God will get you. <laughs> uh, uh, there is also this. Take a look. Well, first of all, since you've been promoting this so well. Uh, well I'm, by the way, I own no Apple stock. I'm not going to. Um, but the iPhone. The no, no, iPhone. no. no but, okay, go ahead. But, but before you say you don't know no Apple stock, there is this. Regrettably. <laughs> what was that? You had a fund for applications, though. We raised a $100 million iPhone. Right. And uh, we announced it the day they announced the App Store. We had no idea if this was going to work or not. In the first year, we got 5,000 proposals for new ventures. We read them all. Okay. And then we invested in 14 companies, three right. of which are stealth. I want to tell you some statistics. These blew me away when I looked at them. This year, those ventures are going to do $100 million in revenues. They have 100 million people who downloaded their applications. And those people are spending 80 million minutes a day in these applications. And so in, in uh, 14 or so months, we ran out of money, $100 million was blown. So we went back to you know the piggy bank and got another $100 million so we could invest in iPads, in iPad applications, um, and other tablets. So, so what's with Steve and Adobe? <laughs> what you were thinking, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, he, he, he has a note on his website about it. I know he, said, he says uh, Flash is buggy and uses a lot of processing power, and it's it's, it's not part of the platform. Do you think that was it, a processing power or something else? No, it uses up the battery life. That's what right. troubles him. The battery is key. One of the magical things about this, it runs for 10 hours. Part of that's the battery, part of that's the processor. Let me go off on a quick little tangent, because yeah. I was just reading something, and, and I'm doing something with Bill Gates uh, in about a week or two about the energy. How, are we making great progress in terms of understanding uh, how to make better batteries? No, battery improvement is coming very slowly. There are some disruptive things uh, kind of over the edge of the horizon, the, the, on our radar, but it, it's been painfully slow. All right, anything but batteries are super okay. important. Beyond Adobe, I mean, what, what else does this need uh, to make it better? In other words, where, how will it be different? Let's assume that people at Apple know how to make it better. 
Oh, they what do, do they they're, need they're, to do they're in they're the next working. year to say? I, I think so it'll work, be a very the work needs to be done out here by the entrepreneurs, the innovators. It's the, it's the applications right. and the services that'll go on this. I mean, there's the obvious things that people they want to camera and so forth, but. Um, We've just begun. These things are going to have ten times more memory. They're going to be five times as fast, yeah. and that will happen in three to five years. It's going to be remarkable. They'll have a terabyte of storage. They'll hold hundreds of full-length movies. Will they have phones and cameras? Uh, will they be connected? Will they have multiple applications so you can use I don't, multiple I don't applications? Think, I don't think they're going to have a phone in it. You know, I think it's a little <laughs> <laughs> well, you could talk to it like that. Okay, let me, let me talk about one thing. Mentioning Steve Jobs, and I want to talk about Pincus and others. But if you talk about Jobs and Gates and Bezos and Larry and Sergey and Mark Zuckerberg, what do they have in common? I mean, you know these people. Is there? A I, it's a good question. I was thinking about this, and when I when I met these people, they were all in their twenties or thirties. Uh, they were male. They were dropouts, usually of computer science programs at great universities like Harvard and Stanford. And they were nerds. Ironically, they had no social life whatsoever here on the verge of this great social revolution. Yeah. And I think that's because they were uh, caught in a desperate, deep love affair with their companies. They were passionate about the products that their companies were creating. And, uh, and, and they were out to change the world, absolutely and, and positively. I, I, I think they were, uh, they were missionaries. They were on a mission, not mercenaries. Okay, explain that, because you have, you made that distinction to me some time ago, the difference in missionaries and mercenaries. Yeah, so this is, this is about culture. And I don't want to draw too great an extreme, but in tech companies, whether it's Silicon Alley or Silicon Valley, you can see these two kinds of cultures to varying degrees. The, the mercenaries are really like Andy Grove, uh, paranoid and, and very opportunistic. They're driven by fear. The missionaries, on the other hand, they're pulled by passion. They they see opportunity and and, and um, the ability to do something strategic. The mercenaries are always after the deal. The missionaries are seeking the, the partnership for the long run. The mercenaries, they're in a kind of a race, a, a sprint to beat the competition. The missionary culture is, uh, is really obsessing on the culture, the customer. That's what Jeff Bezos always tells us. So mercenaries, they're motivated by financial statements, and, 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 uh, and, and there's sometimes a sense of kind of entitlement in the mercenary cultures. The missionary cultures, are all about value statements. Bill Campbell tells us that, and, and, and they're about a contribution as opposed to an entitlement. Get to the bottom line, the mercenaries have got an incredible lust for making money, and the missionaries are interested in making meaning and also money. I think anybody who tells you they're not interested in making money is probably not telling you the truth. Well, of course they're not, but I mean, and, and Clearly, Michael but, Arrington but, is interested in that. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, Michael Mercier, missionary. but where this comes home is when you, when you look at a Steve He's Jobs. He's a missionary from mercenary. <laughs> when you look at a Steve Jobs or a Mark Zuckerberg or yeah. a Mark Pincus or a Jeff Bezos, these folks have turned down opportunities to sell their companies for maybe a billion dollars. Well, that's because they, and they don't. That's because they were betting on the con. It's because they're on a mission. Okay. They're passionate about Steve, these products. Steve Jobs famously said, and it's least been attributed to him, that Bill Gates was more Rockefeller than Edison. <laughs> well, they have Are most of these people more Rockefeller, more Edison than Rockefeller? Is that what you're saying? Well, they're oh. different, but I think they're all they're passionate about product. Product is our most important product. Okay. Think about your firm line of work and, and sort of this really remarkable series of successes and, and some not so successful, uh, which is the nature of the venture capital business. Right. You know, you, you lay down your bat and you hope the best ones will come through in an extraordinary way and you understand that some will not. And if you don't risk, you will never succeed. Yeah. Um, when you look at Zynga, mm -hmm. how good is it compared to everything else you've ever done? It's spectacular. We invested, it's the fastest rising. We, in, we invested in Zynga 20 months ago, and it's the fastest growing venture we've ever backed. Now, why is that? I mean, in other words, is well, it? Uh, first of all, the, the people there are extraordinary, and they have figures team have figured out how to monetize mm -hmm. these new social mobile networks more effectively than than anyone else. This I, advertising, of course, is always one way, but this idea that. 98% of the people who play your game, they obsess on these games. 
uh, do so for free, but there's about 2% of them that want to get some more poker chips, or they want to they want to buy the better tractor and give it to their friend in the farm bill, or, or they want to uh, buy some seeds for Haiti. They raised $3.6 million for Haiti in, in the course of just a couple of days. So the social networks, the user pay model, the Zynga model is, is, is very powerful stuff. They, uh, you know, any given day, more than 30 million people are playing Farmville. But that's, that's more people than are watching 60 Minutes. That, that, that's as much as every man, woman, and child in the state of California. 30 million is a big daily audience. 60 million daily users across their games, 240 million. So what can you do with that? Uh, other well, than monetize it. I mean, well, what can you do with it other than you can, the fact that playing games, I mean, you, is there a you, way to... You can do an incredibly important thing. Think take, about, take that group and do something else with it. Think about this. Right now, there's no single branded place on the internet to go and have fun to make social relationships happen. How do we make meaning out of life with each other? And so these social games allow you to, uh, in a way that's very different than uh, Nintendo or, or, uh, or, or the Sony PlayStation, those kind of shoot em up, totally absorbing action games, to fill the nooks and crannies of your life, waiting at the bus station, you're on the train. In fact, the games are designed so they're not so absorbing. You play them for a while, you want to go away from them, then come back the next day and back again the next day. So they become a kind of of, uh, of habit that connects you with each other. The, the, back to the third wave idea. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk in the, in the next conversation about Facebook and about social networks. Yeah. I mean, is, is, the, is the core of the third wave the convergence of social networks and more? I think it's a social, absolutely, that's at the core. But I want to add that I think we're seeing really change, all of these are changes in consumer behavior, and it's also happening in new commerce. Change. Social, mobile, and new commerce. New commerce meaning all the things like what? Well, uh, one of my favorites, and this is a shout out, forgive me, is uh, uh, Mark Pickens' wife, Allie, has founded a great company called One King's Lane. Every other day, 50% of their customers, 50% every other back. day, go to One King's Lane to uh, look at to buy the product. And what will they find there? Uh, they'll find limited sale, uh, glorious, luxurious, unique products uh, that are limited in number. So, you better get it. When you think about now, sign up. Social networking. <laughs> social networking is going to be the. Yuri um, will tell us that he thinks social networking is is an old idea that.